Uh, my name is Adam Jakey. I'm the Extension Wildlife Specialist at Iowa State. So I have responsibilities for all things wildlife uh, in Iowa. And my research interests are in wildlife habitat relationships. And uh, what I had worked on before I started in Iowa was mostly birds, bird relationship to habitat, wetlands, and, and uh, early successional habitats on farms. And the bat thing is actually pretty new to me. Uh, that kind of comes along with the extension part of my job where I just kind of work on uh, whatever important priority issues there are uh, in the state. In the situation with bats right now, uh, I presume maybe this is why you're in here, is pretty grim. Uh, we've got a lot of challenges that we face with bats uh, in bat conservation in the Midwest, stuff that has not been with us very long. In 2006, we were churning along. We had some issues with bats, uh, you know, related to forest stewardship challenges and things like that. But then this disease, white nose syndrome, came on the scene and has really changed the game and made it uh, for some real concern about some of our populations. So uh, I, I started to learn a lot about that in the last two years, and I've really enjoyed what I've learned, and this is kind of just uh, a manifestation of that, what I know about bats and, and what I know about forest habitat management for bats. Now, the uh, grand reveal is um, it's pretty cool, as I read and interpreted the literature. Now, there's species variability, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but not really dig into it. But uh, basically, bats just like healthy forests. It's as easy as that. And I know that kind of sounds weird, but uh, that's, they are uniquely closely tied to the factors that we tend to manage forests for, at least in this part of the country. Now, uh, other parts of the country are different. But in the Midwest, a, oak, or a forest that's regenerating oaks that has relatively open canopy structure, uh, high plant diversity, and good vegetation structure is as good as it gets for a bat. And the good news for us is that's as good as it gets for a forest landowner. It really does come down to that. So that's my takeaway from, and actually you can leave now. Yeah. I'm just kidding, stick around, <laughs> might as well. The, uh, that's my takeaway from this, is it really, it comes down to just really quality uh, forest habitat. So I think that's pretty cool. We're in it together. The other thing that I think is funny about bats and foresters is we basically live in the exact same places. In the woods, and in houses. Bats love finding houses. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's actually pretty interesting the way they find them and stuff. But they really share a lot of space with the forester. They like buildings and they like forests. And that's it. And these things, that's another thing that I think is interesting about bats. They'll go out of the timber to forage, you know, but they relate exclusively to trees. These are exclusively forest dwelling species, at least in our part of the country, with the exception of the building situation. Uh, they are just really just forest dwelling species, and I think that's pretty cool. We're kind of all in it together. We're managing for healthy forests. We want to have oak regeneration. We want to have uh, invasive species under control. And if we do all that stuff, the bats are going to follow along, and the bats are doing us a lot of favors in the timber too by eating insects and things like that. So I'll talk about that, share with you what I know, and then we can uh, take questions and things uh, as we go. So uh, the bat situation. This is a video I took at my at a house in. Uh, in a front yard. And so there's like a bat flashing around every once in a while. Uh, there he goes. And I think he comes back one more time. Anyway, has anybody ever had a more meaningful interaction with a bat? <laughs> yeah, so that's my point. These things are kind of hard. They're, they're hard to understand, right? Like we see deer, deer share a lot of daylight hours with this one, or other mammals, or especially birds, we share a lot of time with. We're active during the day, uh, we're in, they're in the open, they let us look at them, things like that. You can identify them to species, you can kind of build a relationship, and that's how we, as people that spend our time in the natural areas, that's how we learn, right? As we learn about uh, wildlife by observing them in their element, and then kind of incorporating that in their mind and knowing how they're responding to the things we're doing in the forest or the things we're doing on the land, and using that to inform strategies for more or fewer or whatever. This bat situation is really weird because we don't really get that. I mean, yes, the building, there's the building thing, but in the timber, we're not interacting with bats very often, in my assessment. And these, this sort of anonymous flight of some species of bat flying around in the open area is about uh, as good as it gets. Now, I think that's cool, right? I do enjoy, every, I think everybody enjoys seeing a bat on a summer evening. Uh, that's a welcome sight, but it is, I think it's harder to get to know them. So one of the ways, you know, I'm a, uh, educator and we think about ways to communicate some of these things and get people to care about some challenges that we have. So one of the one of the things that I worked with a uh, really talented graphic design student in my at the university with is what we're affectionately calling 
the bat yearbook project. And that is uh, these profile uh, drawings of the bats that we have uh, native to Iowa. So, th and, and these are also the bats, more or less all the bats that we find in Wisconsin and Illinois. The evening bat was just documented in Illinois, or Wisconsin this year for the first time. So it's very, it's not very abundant, but it is uh, in there. And then I think Southern Illinois would have another species or two. But in this part of the world, these are the species we expect to see. Some are more abundant than others. Um, but this is what they look like. And, and this, this builds on that sort of challenge that the anonymity of bats. We had, I had no idea there was a bat that looked like the red bat. And I have a picture, an actual picture of a red bat later. And they really are just about as cool as it gets. This hoary bat, we, we, maybe that it, the, the yearbook project accentuated some of its features a little bit more, but we think it's very regal. And we like uh, the look of the hoary bat. You know, some of these other ones are kind of a, uh, you know, bland brown color, but they all have different characteristics. They have different ear shapes. And of course, you know, bats echolocate. Uh, they're famous for the way that they feed with echolocation and their ears play a role in that. And this little bone inside the ear also plays a role in identification. So anyway, so this is, uh, this is the profile of species we're going to talk about. I mentioned their species variability in their habitat requirements. That stuff is really challenging to study. The way that wildlife biologists study that stuff is one, they all emit different frequencies when they do that echolocation. And so we can use high-tech software to record those frequencies, and then we can also analyze them on the computer. It's not perfect, uh, but we have learned some stuff about species variability uh, in response to different habitat types that way. And then another way is just getting our hands on them. So we put up big nets and we catch them while they're out flying around, and then of course we can identify them. But uh, other than that, it's really hard to identify these maps and, and draw those distinctions. And like I said, I'm going to probably speak more generally about different species of bats and generalizations about habitat quality. And then if you have specifics about uh, individual species, we can maybe talk about that a little bit or we can certainly look up to get some of those answers. So, so okay, what do these bats do? I'm going to talk, uh, actually, I'm going to talk about their life cycle a lot later, but they all share one common characteristic, and I've already alluded to that. Every single one of them is an insectivore. Uh, and that's why we get so many positive ecological benefits from bats. There's studies that they built uh, exclusions to keep them out of corn, uh, and they can show actual negative impacts of excluding bats uh, from corn acres. They actually have positive economic impacts because of the way uh, that they feed, they eat insects. So uh, that's another reason to like bats is because they're out there eating some of the stuff that we don't uh, necessarily like, and they play an important role in the forest. Most of that foraging is done by echolocation. As I said, they're catching stuff in the air. That will come into play when we talk about foraging habitat. But they also glean. They also just, just like, I don't think anybody would say no to a free meal. If they're on a tree uh, and they hear an insect nearby, they'll just walk over and catch it. Uh, it's a little, it's funny to watch a bat walk on a tree. There's videos of it. But so anyway, but most of their, most of their foraging is in the air. The other thing is they're all forest dependent, and I already alluded to this, but I want to just kind of reinforce this, is everything that drives Midwestern bat populations is happening in the timber. Now, there's bats in other parts of the world that actually pollinate crops. If anybody likes tequila, you have bats to thank for that, uh, because a species of bat is the primary uh, pollinator for the plant that produces tequila. Uh, and they grow up, they live in deserts and rainforests and all sorts of different ecosystems. But here in the Midwest, they are forest uh, dependent animals and tree dependent mainly. So now uh, there's two different sorts of life strategies w within the year. And we're gonna I'm going to emphasize this throughout as well as I talk about the life cycle. But four of these species uh, are what we call migrant bats. So they, they come up here and actually most of the time the only um, bats that come up into the upper Midwest are oftentimes just the females. They come up from the south and they raise their young here in our forest, take advantage of our insects and our places to, to uh, raise their young to maturity through nursing, and then once the young start to fly, feed on their own. And then they take off and they head back to the southern United States. A lot of them, once they get back to the southern, southern United States, migrant, or uh, excuse me, hibernate, uh, but they don't do it up here in the upper Midwest. They're, they're migrant back. And some of these things go way up into Canada. So we'll actually have, just like we have, ducks and geese and lots of birds that just stop over here. We have the same thing going on uh, with some of these species of migratory bats, making long distance uh, movements. 
The opposite end of that spectrum are, are the ones that are in it with us for the whole year. And they're the hibernating bats. And again, some of those migrant bats do still hibernate. But these are the species that will hibernate in, in, in Iowa, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Now, again, some of them move more than others. Um, Indiana bat, for example, will, uh, has really strong allegiances to specific hibernation locations. And they're the most gregarious species of all the bats. And so they have these huge concentrations of uh, hibernating, wintering bats in very specific locations. And those, those locations are mostly southern Illinois, northern Missouri, southern Indiana, Kentucky. Uh, it's, it's a very Midwestern bat. And they won't go very far away from those wintering areas, from where they hibernate. Other bats will spread out across the state. And then, uh, you know, I've already mentioned that some of these things don't mind hibernating in buildings. The big brown bat is the most abundant bat that we have in the region. And it's also, uh, the scientific name of this is actually translates from Latin to, to English as house flyer because they're, they have such a strong affinity. The naturalists recognize that when they named them. They have such a strong affinity for houses. And, that's, and so they'll even hibernate with us in our, in our houses, in the attics, or old, old buildings and barns and things like that. So anyway, those are our hibernating species. Uh, and that'll become relevant as we go on later in the talk and talk about white nose syndrome. So what I'm going to do, actually, is kind of something different. I, I thought, with the species like this, we really need to understand where they are throughout the different times of the year. And the management for bats comes down to thinking about where the bats are in the calendar and what they need during these different life phases. So what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through a year in the life of a bat uh, and talk about some of the considerations to think about for bat uh, management throughout the year. So the first, uh, we'll start, oh, that's going faster than I expected. Uh, I don't, these sorts of things always mess up. OK, so the first one is the insects. The bats obviously aren't on the landscape when we don't have insects for them to feed on. And so during the winter time, you're not going to find a bat unless um, you find it in hibernation. Or like I said, I keep foreshadowing this white nose syndrome thing. Uh, if it's out during the winter time, it's an issue. They shouldn't be out during the winter time because they're insectivores. And of course, they're not going to find insects in the air uh, to feed on during the winter time. So uh, until this time of year, there's no bats around. So that's why I started the calendar here on March, in March, because that once the insects start to emerge here, this time of year in the spring is when the bats start to come back. And it's relatively fast. And so the bats are back uh, right now. And what matters right now is we need to create and maintain good foraging habitat for bats. Now, we need to do this throughout the year. And, and we need to strategize how we create good foraging habitat for bats throughout the year. But I think this early time is the time to really think about. That's a really consequential thing. When they show back up, we need to be thinking about where they're going to be uh, in how effective they're going to be uh, in our forest where they're feeding. So we'll jump over and talk about foraging habitat. And uh, as I mentioned already, I ruined the surprise on this. It just looks like good forest management is good bat habitat. And so bats, generally, based on those studies that I mentioned, where we put the acoustic recording devices in the timber, or we put nets up in the timber and capture them, or we tie things onto them and follow them around with tracking devices, we have inferred that they tend to like an open canopy. Most species of bats, there's a few exceptions. Northern long ear bats are thought to be more uh, inclined towards uh, forest interiors. But they generally like open canopy structure uh, forms. One characteristic that bat biologists talk about a lot is kind of something weird. We don't think about it a lot as foresters, because we think about, or forest land managers, we think about what's at the eye level in the ground, and then we think about the canopy. We don't tend to think about what's in between. And that's really consequential for a bat, what's in between, because that's where they forage. And so bat biologists talk about this term called canopy clutter. And clutter, the reason they call it clutter is because it is anything in the canopy, and I'm talking like, well, on the next slide I'll talk about some heights, but anything from the ground up to, I don't remember what the number is, 20 feet. Um, anything from the ground up to 20 feet, we want to think about what is going to inhibit their ability to shoot that echolocation sim signal out and get a clean feedback on where the insects are. So clutter, that's just stuff in that middle ground area, that area where they want to feed, creates a challenge for them to feed. They're less efficient feeding there, and they don't like to be 
in those areas. So stuff that has a lot of mid-story isn't great bat habitat. So uh, we want to try to keep clutter down, and we want to think about, and here's that, uh, those numbers. We want to think about what's in our understory and what's in our mid-story for, for areas for the bats to forage, because that's where a majority of that foraging is occurring. Another thing is bats really like edges. They like, all, all these species really tend to relate to edges. In, in this case, uh, this is a transition into sort of a savanna. It was kind of the best picture I had of an edge. But we know bats go way out over crop fields to feed. We know bats feed in cities and in, uh, uh, underneath city lights where insects are aggregated. They, they aren't necessarily afraid to venture away from the timber. All their foraging isn't necessarily occurring in the timber. So edges are also valuable habitat. So don't forget about managing those areas and there's also uh, you know, sort of meaningful impacts for bats. They're not just dwelling in the deep darks of our forest. They're right out there on the edges. They're right in our cities, right there with us, wherever they can find insects. Another thing that bats really like is uh, aquatic habitats, relating to aquatic habitat. And that's just because there's a lot of insects there, right? Because a lot of insects have life cycles where they hatch and emerge out of aquatic systems. So we consistently find that bats relate to streams in Iowa, they relate to wetlands, they relate to lakes, they like these types of areas. So we like to talk, you know, there's a lot of good reasons to protect forests adjacent to waterways, you know, for uh, water quality and, and soil health and, and other reasons, but it's really important for bats too. Uh, areas around water uh, sources are really critical habitat for bats. And then the last thing is plant diversity, and I imagine this is probably a scene that many of you are familiar with. Everything green in that picture, at least below the, the the tree canopy is, of course, honeysuckle. Um, and this is an exotic invasive shrub, and, and buckthorn is the northern uh, equivalent. And you remember what I said about that lower and mid story vegetation being really consequential for bats. Well, this invasive species is that's a, that's its sweet spot. Honeysuckle and buckthorn grows right in that key strata uh, where bats want to forage. The other thing is. By definition, the less diversity you have in the understory, the fewer insects you're going to have. Because insects just like, or insects have specific requirements for host plants. They have uh, preferences for different uh, flowering periods and uh, all sorts of other um, life history strategies that necessitate that they need lots of different plants in the understory. So insects forage prey base for bats is going to be less abundant in areas that are completely uh, dominated by exotic invasive shrubs. So the structure isn't right, and then also the understory isn't right. So back again, sound forest management, where we're addressing invasive species problems, uh, that'll also address things like oak recruitment and other uh, important things we expect to get out of our timber, that's going to be good for bats. And so this is, I think, a better example of a timber stand down in Des Moines County, Iowa, which is southeastern Iowa, where the folks are engaged in some really intensive management of this timber stand. Uh, with the goal of creating bat habitat, among other things. And they've monitored this, and they've documented all nine of those species of bats uh, in Iowa to be using this stand. And so there's uh, diverse forest regen or diverse um, plant assemblages in the understory, and then there's also lots of oak regeneration going on in this because of their combined efforts for invasive species control and fire uh, and things like that. So it's really important to think about that for bat habitat. So. Okay, we're going to see, this is probably going to go wrong again based on my first trial. So in May, we start to concern ourselves with moth. That's what flashed on there, and it could have stayed around longer. But May, June, July, and end of August. Is it coming? That was a lot prettier on my computer, just for what it's worth. But anyway, okay, so end of August 1st. Now this is my opinion here on the dates. So you will hear different answers from different biologists. There's a tendency uh, for being pretty conservative on bat breeding date ranges. My read on um, May 1st through August 1st is basically um, from talking to bat biologists, folks that know when young are capable to move and when moms are nursing or not nursing, um, that May to August window seems really safe. I think federal regulations, if you have federal cost share and stuff, they tend to be more uh, conservative, so a longer date range where they want to protect the young. So obviously follow those things, but I think everybody should get behind the idea that starting May 1st, we've got to be careful with how we're um, impacting the standing trees because there could be a lot of uh, 
either immobile young or uh, nursery colonies of mothers. So uh, the other thing that I think a point to be made here is that it's not a great time to be in the timber during the growing season cutting trees anyway because of issues like oak wilt and other uh, potential uh, diseases that could affect the trees. So I actually think here again this is another scenario where doing what's right for the forest is going to be doing what's right for the bats. So uh, that's just another consideration. But during this time of year until August 1st it's really critically important to think about where mom is, where mom is with the young uh, and when those young are going to be mobile. Bats are, it's easy to forget, they are mammals just like us. So the um, mom gives live birth and then mom nurses the young for uh, weeks in, in the tree. She goes out and forages so she can continue to produce that milk and she goes back and she feeds her young. So uh, and then eventually the young become uh, able, able to fly and, and eat insects on their own. So, the, all the different species of bats have variable strategies for raising their young. On one extreme, we have the red bat who just goes at it alone. She's off in the tree, raising her young in, uh, all alone. She, there aren't other mothers around. Um, if she, bring, she comes back to the tree, she leaves the young there for the day, comes back. There's even accounts where red bats, if she thinks she needs to move them to a better tree, she throws them on her back and flies to the next tree with them. Uh, you know, two young, three young at a time. Uh, the other end of that extreme is the Indiana bat, and these are, as I said, really gregarious, and they have these big maternal colonies where lots of moms are raising the young together. They're putting all their young, stuffing them into the same uh, hollow, hollow tree or um, uh, opening of a cave or other places, uh, or uh, loose bark of a tree, and going out feeding and coming back and finding their own young to nurse and stuff. So it's a pretty interesting thing going on. This is where, I assume if you've ever heard anything about bat management, timber management, you've heard about the importance of loose bark trees. And we talk about that a lot because a lot of bats tuck up underneath the loose bark of a tree and that's where they'll spend the day for a day roost and a lot of times they'll also raise their young in those in these what we call maternity roosts. And so loose bark trees, shagbark hickory is the classic example of a loose bark tree that provides a lot of places for them to go up and hide. Here's a picture looking up a shagbark hickory and you can see uh, what it is that a bat may be attracted to. White oak has similar uh, structure like that. Not all white oaks grow like this uh, to have that flaky bark, but many of them do, uh, and that can be really good day roost or maternity uh, roost habitat. Other species include silver maple, uh, shell bark hickory, and American elm, and then also uh, we'll talk about dead and dying trees, and elms, of course, unfortunately have died a lot, but that makes for pretty good uh, loose bark habitat for bats. Uh, another thing, the reason bats are attracted to houses is because that provides structure that they used to find in dead, hollowed out logs and trees for some cases. That basically just passes for them uh, as a place that they could raise their young, provide shelter overhead, and open space for them to move around and places to leave the young. So dead, hollow, dead and or hollow trees can make for really good uh, maternity roots for bats as well and then they also provide that loose bark and then even some bats will use cavities uh, in trees so holes that were either created by a woodpecker or created by uh, decay after a branch broke off uh, some bats will make use of those things always basically related to the trees and then this is that I said I'd have a picture of a red bat this is a red bat and they are really attached to foliage that's their uh, where they mostly relate there's even accounts Apparently some folks can walk through the timber if they know what they're looking for and just look up and you can see red bats attached to foliage because they're, I guess, conspicuous. I've certainly never seen it myself. But so they will, they'll often relate to just clusters of leaves. Uh, there's even uh, some folks down in the southern United States have reported uh, flushing red bats out of just piles of leaves. They'll just down on the ground essentially. So uh, foliage can be another important uh, habitat where you may expect to find bats. It's not all just hollow dead trees or loose bark or anything like that. They can be kind of all over uh, the tree. And then finally, uh, caves are really well known for bats in for winter habitat, for hibernation locations. But they'll also use caves and rock outcrops uh, in the exact same way they lose, use loose bark trees. Any, any place that they can tuck up underneath uh, and find shelter or find suitable temperatures is a place that they'll use uh, either during the day uh, or also uh, to raise their young. So 
uh, caves and rock outcrops, protecting those areas and keeping away from them during the breeding season. If you know there are bats around, it's kind of an important step. So, okay, back to this. And now what we're going to say in August, uh, August, September, and early October, the bats start to move essentially. So the young are what they call bullets. So they're mobile. They can start to move around the timber. They're feeding on their own. Um, mom is very mobile. Migrants are coming down from the north. This is, for many of these species, this would be the first time we ever see, say, a male uh, hoary bat in Iowa. And the reason we're seeing a male is because he was born up north and he's flying south and that's where he'll spend the rest of his life. So um, we start to see migrants come in and then um, they start to think about moving back to hibernation places. An interesting thing about bat behavior is that this time of year is when they breed, actually. So they will actually have, they have a fall breeding period, and then the females have delayed uh, reproduction, essentially. So she'll become pregnant in the fall, but she won't start uh, gestation until the following spring to have her young early in the summer. So it's kind of an interesting behavior. A lot of these bats act, uh, congregate outside the hibernacula, so these important places where they're going to go deep into the ground and find stable temperatures for the winter time in caves or abandoned mines. They'll congregate at the mouth of those and they do what's called swarming. And swarming is their breeding behavior where they're all flying around together and courting uh, and ultimately uh, breed that time of year. So uh, the rule that I'll offer during this time of year is just to get out of the way. They're fine. They're really mobile. Um, this is a time of year where you can be in the timber stand and not necessarily be having uh, negative impacts on the uh, on the bats because they're able to move. The young can get away. The, the young uh, mom isn't raising young in places in the, in the timber, uh, and they, they're pretty resilient this time of year. So the goal for that time of year is stay out of the way and observe uh, when they're headed towards those hibernacula. Uh, you can kind of tune into that and know where those are on your, on your land. So the last one is just advancing on its own, and that one is... Uh, this is the hibernation period. So starting in November, we're starting to lose our insects. And the insects, so once the prey base goes away, the bats are going to sleep. So they feed a lot the fall to prepare for hibernation. And then they, many of them, they either migrate out of the state or they go deep into those areas to hibernate. They seek them out. And this time of year is another time where we're worried about their sensitivity to disturbance, particularly around those key hibernacula. So what... The goal for this time of year is to protect the hibernation areas. If you know you have an area where bats are hibernating on your land, try to stay away from them, try to minimize disturbance, uh, and especially keep uh, this fungus that causes white nose syndrome away from them. And then the other thing to do during the winter, there's lots of work to be done in the timber stand, uh, and it's a good time of year to be out there uh, doing that stuff. So plan for high quality foraging habitat that time of year. So I've been alluding to this white nose syndrome thing all along, but this will be kind of how I wrap this talk up. And this is the part, I, the title of this talk, I think, is what we're doing for bats and why it matters. And this is the why it matters part. Uh, this white nose syndrome is, uh, as the name implies, it was named obviously for the growth of this white fungus on the noses and hairless parts of the bat. Uh, so the wing and on the nose in tail membranes and other places. This is caused by, uh, I'll go to another picture, uh, the growth of this fungus is caused, caused by an exotic species of fungus that was introduced to North America and first documented in North America in 2006. We don't know exactly how it got here. We have, and, and in 2006, it wasn't named. This species of fungus, like the vast majority of these organisms, small organisms like fungus, uh, wasn't researched or understood or named or anything like that. And this guy, the guy that took this photograph, uh, Al Hicks, uh, and others in New York found these mass die-offs of bats in caves during their hibernation period. They all had this white stuff. So they started to research it, and they realized uh, we, what we now know is that this fungus, uh, and I'm going to butcher the Latin name, but uh, because it was unnamed, it got a uh, a pretty dire name by us North Americans. We realized what it was doing to our bats. Pseudo gymno gymnascus or something like that. Um, Destructans is the, the species name of it. And that's for, of course, the destruction that it's done uh, to our bat populations. And so this fungus, 
came over here. Our bats aren't adapted to it. It grows on their, their noses and on their wings and it essentially just stresses them out. It's just, it more or less just annoys them while they're trying to migrate, while they're, or excuse me, while they're trying to hibernate, and trying to sleep. And it uh, taxes them physiologically. So their body's essentially fighting the growth of this fungus. That causes them to wake up during hibernation and fly out of the caves and look for something to feed because they're essentially starving to death. As you can imagine, if a bat, an aerial insectivore, flies out of a cave uh, in the dead of winter in New York or any of these northern states uh, where we have this, uh, this problem with this fungal pathogen, uh, it's not a good condition for them. And so they go out and then they're burning even more energy than they were in the caves uh, and they come back in, but by the time they come back in, they're so uh, physiologically depressed that they can't survive throughout the rest of the migration period. Uh, it, it, I mentioned it was first documented in the United States in 2006 in New York. In 2011, it was first documented in Iowa. 2013, it was first documented in Illinois. In 2014, it was first documented in Wisconsin. And I wouldn't read too much into these numbers. It basically started in the east in this core area. And as the, cut, the, sh the shading of these colors indicated, it slowly moved its way west. The bats are moving this stuff because it can survive on them during the uh, growing season. And they're mobile, as we've discussed, for lots of reasons. Uh, and so the bats are moving this stuff. Once it gets in a cave, the conditions that bats seek out in caves are the exact same conditions that this fungus grows and survives the best in. And so once it gets in the caves, the conditions in the environment are conducive uh, to the persistence of this fungus, and it's uh, likely to infect a lot of the bats in the cave. This is, uh, sorry, kind of an ugly data table, but it's, it paints the picture really nicely. This is a study where they had long-term data. Now, we didn't study a lot of bats before white nose syndrome came along. There were a few people that were kind of interested in it, but we, we didn't have a lot of data. A few places had good data. In, in southern Indiana, in hibernacula, uh, after the introduction of white nose syndrome, in, after the detection of it in 2010, four years later, there was an 80% decline in little brown bats in the hibernacula, a 60% decline in Indiana bats, and a 12% decline in tricolored bats. Now, you see some of those bats actually increase, and some, there's, there's some, we call those sort of interspecific interactions. If one, if one species is declining, other species of bats have been able to increase. There's fewer mouse on the landscape to compete with, and other bats have been able to take advantage of that. But for these species of hibernating bats, it's specifically the hibernating bats that go deep in the caves. And you remember I said big brown bats, spend their, they don't mind hanging out with us during the winter. They have different thermal expectations, and so they're hibernacular. They're not as vulnerable to white nose syndrome as little brown bats, tricolored bats, and northern long-eared bats are because of the conditions that they seek out for their hibernation. In New York, in the first four years of the study, 73% of uh, uh, bats, or an average, in their colony surveys, an average of 73% of bats uh, had died, essentially, in, in the hibernacula that they were surveying, of these vulnerable species, little brown bats uh, being the main one. So that means if you looked at bats in your backyard, and you saw 10 last year, this year you can expect to see 3.3 bats. I mean, it, in a matter of 12 years, this the uh, number of bats in North America uh, has declined precipitously. This is actually an old number, an estimate that in the first, I think, like 10 years or so after the introduction of this exotic fungus, uh, over 8 million individual bats had died. I mean, it is remarkable stuff how fast uh, this has happened in North America. And this is just the challenge that we face. This is the same challenge that forest landowners face with invasive species. It's the same thing as... Um, of uh, Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, um, emerald ash borer, all this stuff. This is, the, this is what we're dealing with in a global economy, right? We're moving stuff all across the world, all the time, in things, organisms that were historically uh, constrained in their distribution by oceans, uh, now can catch a free ride across the ocean every single day, and we're getting uh, to a point where we have, you know, real drastic ecosystem uh, consequences. In this case, this uh, exotic fungus that has a wide old world distribution uh, and their bats are adapted to it and our bats just simply weren't. So it's a real challenge that we face here uh, 
in, in the Midwest and in North America. So, okay, so that's all for my map. The, what I want to do is, we're, so now we're back around to the end, and I'll just offer some sort of summary comments for you in sort of wrapping all this up. So there's not a lot of good news on the white nose syndrome thing. There, I mean, it is really serious uh, threats to some of these populations, little brown bats, tricolor bats, northern long eared bats, and Indiana bats. Are, are the ones that we're most concerned about around here. Um, what I do perceive, though, is that there's potential for um, high-quality habitat to be a way for them to kind of fight through. It, frankly, it's pretty much the only thing we have control over, because we can't control the spread of this fungal pathogen. It's in North America, and I said the bats move this stuff really efficiently. And so uh, we're not going to prevent it from going into the caves. It is important, if we're ever in caves, to try to do things to ensure that we aren't spreading it. Uh, but beyond that, human behaviors, we can't really do much about it. But what we can do is we can manage forests uh, in a way that can potentially help the moms that survive uh, successfully rear their young. There's an interesting study coming out of Canada. There's a really sharp uh, group up there doing some really nice work on bats in addressing the challenges the white nose syndrome pre pre presents. And they have this study where they are putting up insulated bat houses that are heated, and the heated bat houses are somehow helping the mothers that survive white nose syndrome during the winter time successfully rear their young. Now, I don't think we're going to install heated bat houses across the countryside, but what it does show is that if ideal or, or, um, uh, habitat is in place for them, stuff that allows them to minimize their physiological stress during the breeding season, it, it, we're hopeful that whatever it is that helps that mom get through, fight the white nose syndrome infection, uh, and get through the winter time, we're hopeful that if she can raise her young, she'll pass those genes on to her young, and that's the way that we'll beat this white nose syndrome thing. Uh, I don't really, I don't have a crystal ball to know whether or not we will with some of these species, but I think uh, in the meantime, the only thing we can do is try to create a forest, uh, forest habitat that's really good for bats. Going back to my very first point that I made, hey, that's going to look good for a whole bunch of things that we face challenges with uh, in Midwestern forest stewardship, like oak regeneration and uh, finding invasive species. So healthy forests are what bats need, and I think um, you know what you're doing in your timber stand is having positive impacts on bats, and don't forget that. And then maybe think about some of those considerations about uh, the timing of actions or the management of certain characteristics of the canopy for bats. Uh, manage disturbances and key habitats during key periods. That May to August window, try to leave them alone, try to minimize the disturbance, particularly to those day roosts and those uh, maternal uh, colony locations. Promote diversity in everything you do because that's going to fight the next thing that jumps on board from whatever continent it's coming from. Uh, and it's also going to be really good for bats because it's going to create a lot of insect uh, habitat. The bats will take advantage of that. Open forest structure that promotes tree recruitment and then protect riparian areas. So that's my summary uh, in sort of key talking points. I'd love to take any questions you have. What about bat houses? Yeah, I, bat houses are a question we get a lot. And um, that's in the category of it can't hurt. Uh, I don't think, you know, again, I don't think we'll bat house our way out of some of these challenges. But, um, yeah, I, they certainly don't do any harm, bat houses don't. The occupancy rates tend to be pretty low because they're just they don't, they're not looking for them. And now there's a lot fewer bats on the landscape uh, to be looking for them. But uh, I do encourage folks to do it. Um, and then if you put them, particularly if you live in the city or something like that, you're going to get a lot of free insect control out of the deal too if they find them. So yeah. So that's a good question. How many young do they have? It's between one and three for most of these species, and it's species specific. Um, and you know what, I can't think off the top of my head which one just has one. I think little browns just have one, but I can't remember. Don't quote me on that. But some of them just have one. Some of them have one, two, three. Uh, the other thing that's noteworthy is that they tradition historically had really high lifetime reproduction. So they have this life history strategy where she just says, I'm just going to raise one or two or three this year. But over the lifetime, I'm going to win because I'm playing the long game. I'm, you know, they, bats are uh, our most long-lived mammals. Pre-white nose syndrome, or excuse me, one of our most long-lived wild mammals in uh, the Midwest. They have really long lifespans, 10, 12 years, many of them. And so she can have a lot of young over a lifespan with, with that breeding strategy. Uh, 
the challenge that a disease like this faces is that when you have really high mortality in a species that relies on living a long time to replace itself, uh, that creates a real challenge in this population. Contrast that, for example, with something like a, uh, you know, a bobwhite quail. You know, 5% of bobwhite quail make it through the wintertime, and that's fine because she can pull off like 18 young uh, this summer, and they'll all make it, and 5% of them will, you know, survive until the winter, uh, and, and that's fine. So, so these long-lived species, when they get this totally novel uh, mortality source, it's a uniquely uh, uh, strong threat to their population. So, but yes. Yeah, that's another great question. So, can they, if they get through the winter, can they get well and survive? And we, yes, we know that. And like that, uh, that goofy study I mentioned in Canada with the, they're called the pop boxes, uh, that proves that idea. If she can survive the threat that the fungus infection presents during the winter time and make it out, uh, she can recover and reproduce. We also do know that um, an infection during the summer wintertime can hinder her reproduction as well because I, you know we know that for many we call those cross seasonal effects if if a um, animal isn't feeling good coming out of the winter they're less likely to be able to uh, meet the task that it is to raise young produce all that milk and, and get them to uh, fledging so uh, we want healthy bats coming out but if we can't get healthy bats coming out we want them to have the best resources they can once they get out so, yeah and then, then, and then another thing that you made me have to think is, uh, you know, I mentioned old world bats are adapted to this. They, they have this fungus. So we know theoretically bats can live with white nose syndrome with this PD fungus. Um, and so we're, there is hope that what they call genetic rescue, that the, that the few that survive can pass their genes on to the next one. And that that's a heritable trait that, uh, that survival gene gets passed on, and then they have young and they pass on, and then they could potentially just, you know, uh, the population could become resilient. And so, but what we have to do is we're in this tailspin right now with bat populations crashing all across the eastern United States, and we have to get them. We got to make sure that they don't just blink out essentially, so that they can mount that genetic. Here. They're not the same species. They're different species. They're, of course, very closely genetically related, but so. And that's the challenge that it presents. So. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, basically, can, um, you know, yeah, we, we do encourage folks to, tr to not, you know, kill bats in the house during the, the winter time, particularly, uh, well, any time of year. But during the winter time, if you let them outside, you're killing them too, right? Uh, and so there are some folks that are doing rehabilitation with those. Uh, you know, there's there's legitimate human health concerns. You don't want a bat living in your house, and so we we do understand you got to get them out. But uh, there are some rehabbers doing that, uh, rehabbing them through this through the winter and then releasing them in the summer, and that's that's good. I don't know, I don't know that that would turn it around, but I think every little bit helps for sure. So, oh, that's an interesting question. I do not know. I the one I mean, you would expect just. The ones that could breed would be the more closely related. And most of those nine species are in a different genus, so indicating that they're pretty distantly related. Uh, I think four of them, the ones that, well, so Indiana bat, long eared bat, and little brown bat, I think that's the three, three are in the myotis genus, so maybe there, but I don't, I don't know anything about interbreeding with bat. Oh, that's a good question. Do bats have predators? Um, you know, not really, and that's kind of a factor in that long um, lifespan. It's not a lot is eating bats. Not a lot is killing bats historically. So I don't even, I can't even think of what does eat a bat. Owls, hawks. Yeah, I'm sure hawks and owls would pick them off. Um, you know, nothing like if they find them, especially young. I'm sure there's. I really don't know, but I can go out on a limb. I'm sure there's relatively high juvenile mortality among some species because. A squirrel would eat a baby bat if it found it, you know, a, kind of a free protein package in a tree. Um, but I don't know. That's an interesting question. I, you know, you don't talk like that's the thing with bats is you really we don't talk about these like with game birds, is, which is what I work on the most. It's like protecting them from the next thing that wants to kill them, and everything wants to kill a game bird. 
uh, bats, really it's just about letting them live this long life that they have and eventually having enough reproduction uh, out of an individual to you know, replace yourself in the population. So it's an interesting question. I'll have to look that up, what, the, what, what is eating the bats. That's a great point, is that, yeah, humans could potentially spread uh, the disease or the white nose syndrome around, uh, and we want to avoid stressing them out when they're in the caves. And there are recommendations from, there's, I think it's whitenosesyndrome.org, it's a Fish and Wildlife Service website that has decontamination protocols that they're advertising to cavers in parts of the country where caving is more popular. And then the other thing that I think is a real, really big threat would be if you were in a cave that potentially had white nose and then you wore those same boots next week on a vacation in Colorado or something like that. We're really worried about people moving this thing across the country. I showed you how fast the bats moved it across the western United States, but we're lucky because there's the Great Plains between us and the next stop for really good bat habitat, and that's in the western United States. And once this stuff takes off the western United States, we're going to have real big issues out there as well. And it's already in Washington, and we have no idea how it got there. So, and we think that humans might be a cause. This is, I don't remember exactly what the decontamination protocol is, but it's like stuff you buy at the store. It's not really complicated stuff. Um, and so I just wouldn't be, I don't know if like a rubbing alcohol type thing would kill it or not. I just don't know off the top of my head, but I'd check out whitenosesyndrome.org. That'll give you the answer. And it's a good question. We do definitely want to concern ourselves. So do bats eat, okay, we, do bats get rabies? Yes, very much so. Um, it, there's a perception um, that bats are like all rabid, and that's very much not true. It's a small percentage of bats, like it is with most mammals, uh, that tend to have uh, a small percentage have rabies. Now, bats are a leading exposure vector for humans in rabies. And the reason for that, and I'm kind of going out on a limb, but I think you'll agree, if you line up all the potential rabies vectors, starting with red fox and then striped skunk and coyote and raccoon and dogs and all these other ones, which one are you most likely to pick up with your bare hands? Yeah. It's probably not a red fox. It's probably not a striped skunk. And so humans, there's, we want to encourage people to not be complacent around bats. Bats in a house, I mentioned, are really, I mean, it is a big deal. You know, there's, um, particularly because of concerns about rabies. Uh, in, a really, really small percentage of bats have rabies, uh, but any time you handle a bat, it should be with leather gloves and it should be exercising in caution. And that's true of any mammal. Any time you handle any mammal, we're, we all could potentially, you know, uh, contract rabies from a mammal. So uh, that's a great question. And we actually, you know, one of the challenges we have with bats, I mentioned, you know, like we don't, nobody has a really like positive interaction with bats, and then there's lots of negative portrayals of bats in sort of folklore and pop culture. You know, they live in dark places and they rabid and they, you know, they come out of scary houses and Halloween movies and all this stuff. And that's a real challenge to, for motivating people to care about bats, to care about bat habitat and to fight this uh, really bad uh, disease that we're facing in this population. So that's a good question to come up and I do try whenever I can to, to talk to folks about that. Yeah, sure, rabies is a risk. Um, but it's a risk with any mammal, and just, you know, be careful. So, oh, do they eat honeybees? I have no idea. I think I was, like, kind of dodging that question. <laughs> um, I don't think a bat would say no. Now, we've done studies on bat diets, and bats are eating a ton of moths and a ton of beetles. That's the two things that bats like the most are moths and beetles. Um, and you can search online. There's some awesome videos of how they catch them, too. It's not all, like, with their mouth. They'll fly up, and then they use this the, the membrane between their what our, our our legs, the membrane between their legs and their tail, and they wrap a moth up in that membrane, and then fly back to the tree. And it's really cool. So, uh, but anyway, so uh, they it's most mostly moths, mostly beetles, uh, lots of midges, and that's where mosquitoes come in. We always they don't eat a ton of mosquitoes, but we always say they eat mosquitoes to get buy-in. The folks, uh, and I mentioned. Uh, Beetles, one, you know, corn rootworm is a big deal uh, in, across the corn belt here, and corn rootworm turns into an adult beetle, and bats eat that stuff like it's going out of style. They have really uh, uh, positive, as I mentioned, positive impacts on corn because they eat those adult corn rootworms. So that's a cucumber beetle. So, I, so yeah, I think they would eat a honeybee, but not very many. They, 
They really like moths. They're usually in the way. There we go. Yeah, that would be really 